languages and I always I always wanted to travel and explore the world and I felt like languages were a good way to do that um so yeah I started with Spanish in middle school and then French in high school um I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life so I moved to New Orleans um for my undergrad and I did Latin American studies as my major um at Loyola New Orleans and something really important I think that I did in that time was study abroad I highly encourage you if you go to university and you have the chance to study abroad really do it for me my semester there was the same price or even cheaper compared to my my home university and that semester really opened my eyes um, I lived in Valparaiso Chile and it was my first time really like experiencing exploring outside of my own country and it it really like got me excited about the world um yeah and then after undergrad I took some time to figure out what I wanted to do and I also encourage you that like you don't have to decide right away and I wasn't really sure after a bachelor's in Latin American studies what I wanted to do um after a couple of years I ended up going into the Peace Corps and I lived in Ukraine um for two years and three months is how long 27 months is the Peace Corps So I lived in a village in Western Ukraine and learned Ukrainian. My Ukrainian is actually pretty decent um, because you're really immersed in the Peace Corps and they give you three months of training in language and culture and the norms. And then you live um, in a, a small town or a, some people are in cities and you live with a host family. And it was a really great way to learn about Ukrainian culture and language and food and everything. And Yeah, after that, I decided this is what I really liked because the Peace Corps is international development um, through the U.S. government on a grassroots level. And that's like what I decided to do my master's in. So then I moved to Paris, France, did a master's in international development at Sciences Po, it's called, just the name of the university. And then during that, I did an internship at UNDP, which is the United Nations Development Program. So that's the only professional experience I'd say I have with the UN. So it's then Something important about the UN, I think, is that it's not just the international negotiations that happen at United Nations headquarters that you picture in the General Assembly, but there's also all the UN agencies and programs and different things. So UNDP is the development program. It's also headquartered in New York, but then uh, countries around the world all have their own country office. So I worked in the country office in Ukraine, so back to Ukraine, and lived in Kiev. And then I worked on um, topics of democratic governance and rule of law. So At that time, they were talking a lot about, this was in 2019. Um, it was actually a really interesting time to be there. Um, to take a slight political turn, this is when the Trump, uh, like Ukraine tapes, Kiev tapes came out and he was being impeached and I was there. So that was really interesting. Um, but I worked on democratic governance and they were looking at um, reforms in the Ukrainian government to be kind of more democratic. So they were looking at a lot of judicial reforms, like how to make the courts more fair. Um, that was really interesting to be part of that. And then after that, I got a job at this think tank, which is a type of research organization. Uh, it's based in Cologne, Germany, and I live in Berlin, Germany. And I travel really often to Brussels, Belgium, which is where most of the institutions for the European Union are. And I work a lot on governance um, in the European Union. So what is governance? Governance is the way we do government, the way countries work together uh, within themselves and with, like between each other. And the EU, because I don't know how much you know about the EU, I did not know anything about the EU when I started this job. Um, and now I know quite a lot. So the EU has 27 member states. It's a bit like the UN in some ways. Um, but then it's called supranational. So we have national like level government. So like the US or Germany, national level government, but then there's supranational, which is a level above national, which in the EU's case, again, takes these 27 countries together where they have to negotiate things like trade and different types of policy, like migration is a big topic now um, and how they can have a common policy that they do together But at the same time, each government also has its own policies. So it's this really interesting way of working. And I think that there's nothing that compares to it, really, because the EU, there's no other union in the way that the European Union is. But it's like the UN in some ways, because, again, you have to negotiate between countries. And each country has its own interests, its own economic standing. The EU has some very rich countries like Germany and France. But there's also countries like Bulgaria and Romania and Hungary, which are much um, poorer. And then have kind of different interests at heart, especially where they share 
a border, you know, they're more Eastern European, they're, they don't share a border with Russia, but they, some of them share a border with Ukraine, and then they have more security concerns compared to like France. So um, really interesting. And I can get more into that a bit later. Uh, the last thing I want to come to is the UN. So I recently got to go to New York for the summit of the future, which was really cool. It was my first like actual like UN headquarters experience because I did this internship at UNDP, but then you're really focused on the national context when you're in this um, like country office. And the summit of the future was a, a global summit at United Nations headquarters in New York City. And it was all about, so there was this paper that came out last year called Our Common Agenda which was written by the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. And that was for the 75th anniversary of the UN. So I don't know if you knew that was like the timing of this, um, but you're in model UN at a cool time. And it was all about reinvigorated multilateralism. So I talked about supranational, then multilateral is like many countries. So how all of these countries come together to have these discussions and negotiations. And I think a key difference here from the, the EU is the, the EU has this, Europe at the heart of it, right? And then bringing at the UN stage, there's less of a common thing to pull everyone together. I mean, we're all in the same world, but there's a lot more geopolitical things at at hand. And so that's what this report was about, is how to, in this context of climate change and the pandemic and wars, like how do we look at this as our common future, our common agenda uh, to tackle all of these issues? And so it was looking at global solidarity and future generations governance. So how do we make a world, how do we today be thinking about the generations that are to come, you know, like our grandchildren, what world are we leaving for them? Um, so this is then after that report, um, Antonio Guterres proposed this summit of the future where everyone could come together and discuss these things. And so I got to go to that, which was really, really cool. Um, the first two days are what they call action days. So then organizations come and they have events. Um, so they're not then, I mean, there are some from government. There are also some from civil society, like NGOs and, and academics and all different types of organizations. And they come and they give these like one hour events on different topics around the topics that are in the report. So like looking at beyond GDP and economic policy, for example, like how do we measure success in our economy? Is it just because GDP went up or are there more things we can look at that show that we're doing well as a country, as a world, like human well-being, um, living within the boundaries of the planet, you know, protecting ourselves from climate change. And then, um, and then the second two days were the actual summit of the future. And so here's where the representatives from national governments spoke. They each had like three minute slots and then they could talk about what this means to them. And part of that, uh, and this is my last point, is the Pact of the Future is this document that came out of there. So then it's a, a negotiated document. I guess part of what you're doing in Model UN also is having these negotiations for what you all want for your countries. And often declarations or pacts can come out of these negotiations. So in this one, it was the Pact for the Future and this is this document uh, that I recommend online. I recommend reading it because I think it's very interesting. Uh, and that's where they they presented what they see as the as the way forward for our our common agenda, our common future. And part of that is also the declaration for future generations. So coming back to this topic before about like the world we leave the, for future generations, there's a, a declaration in there. So um, a successful summit, and it was really great to be able to go. So yeah, that's about all I have. Okay, Christine, can can you hear me? Yep. All right. Well, can you hear me still? You're now coming through the room sound. Okay. But uh, yeah. Computer. Yeah. And we're gonna have to figure out how best to have people ask questions. But people would ask questions through this camera over here in front of the room. Okay. And uh, Christine, this, this this has been terrific. So much you've done and. So little time, and you've been in hot spots, and you've been working uh, globally. So, um, who has a well, point? Okay. Yeah, I know it's never easy to be the first person, um, but somebody, uh, and you might want to let Christine know what you're representing in the model UN, and uh, maybe dig into her wealth of knowledge about how it is a player in the UN. Yeah, Troy. 
So I'm representing Poland for this thing. Can like what is Poland's influence in the UN and those kinds of things? Well, you heard that. Be, yeah, I heard it. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah. To be honest, I don't know so much about where countries negotiate within the UN, because my background is more in the EU. So I, in the EU, there's been some. I can speak to that uh, if that's okay. I know it's not quite the same thing. Um. So, uh, I want to do it in a careful way that I don't overstep or misrepresent Poland. But there have been some tensions lately where. Poland shares a very large border with Ukraine. And so they have um, more security concerns now in the EU than some other EU countries because they share a very large border with an active war zone. And they also have had a lot of migration over the border, which, I mean, when the war started in Ukraine, Europe took a lot of refugees in and it was very, very open. Um, like it wasn't people, like they were, Europe accepted a lot of Ukrainian refugees with open arms and helped a lot. And Poland by far took the most because it shares this very large border. Um, but it still is not one of the richer countries of the EU. So then it is asking for support of how, you know, to maintain that and how to, like, to give refugees, because refugees need a lot of social assistance because they, they come with nothing. They don't have jobs. They don't have a place to live. So they need a lot of social support from the country. And so then Poland has asked the EU about how they can help with that, because not all countries in the EU have taken on as many people. And another issue is agriculture, which is then a bit of a tension with Ukraine, because Ukraine wants to join the EU and is now on this list of countries that are in the accession process. It can take 10 years. They have to institute a lot of reforms to be able to join the EU so that they have like a strong government, strong rule of law, um, fair courts, things like that. So there's a lot they still have to do before they can actually join. And they also have to, there's a lot with trade agreements. It's very complex, very long process. But Ukraine is a very agricultural country. It's often called the breadbasket of Europe. And Poland is also a very agricultural country. So for them, they see Ukraine joining the EU as a bit of a competition because it will bring prices down as Ukraine is a poorer country and things cost less. So if they are competing within an open market, because Europe has like a common trade market, that's kind of how the EU came to exist. Um, and if Ukraine joins, then they're also selling wheat, which is the same product Poland is selling, but they're selling it cheaper. So then Poland has had this agricultural tension but this as well. And these are the two, I mean, maybe there's more to it than that, but these are the two main things I know. But yeah, sorry, it's in the EU context. I don't know as much about the e the, the UN context. But I, I think you brought up, you know, the dynamics of the economic differences, cost of produce mm -hmm. things, but that's so important. Who else has questions? Uh, again, you know, maybe you want to share with Christine what country you're representing. Anybody? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, sorry, you're at the far end of the table, so I really have a hard time hearing you. Okay, any insight about Estonia? Um, okay, uh, I've been to Estonia, it's very beautiful. Um, a little small country and has an interesting history with its neighbors, uh, Lithuania and Latvia. Um, they did a really cool thing. I don't remember what it's called. They made, and this is just a history lesson. That's very interesting, but something to Google. They did this like human chain near the end of the USSR because the, the Baltics were part of the USSR. And to protest, they did this human chain where everyone like held hands crossing all three countries. Um, and it, I, I don't know, I think that's very cool that people could come together across three countries and make such a huge thing spanning like hundreds of miles. Um, but in modern day, uh, actually, similar to Poland in a way, there's a lot of security concerns because Estonia also shares a border with Russia, so a bit more direct with the, you know, not the country being attacked, but the country attacking. So then there's security concerns about the border and about um, a lot has come up about NATO also with Finland um, because they, you know, if Russia were to expand its invasion, these countries all, that share the border between, like that are in the European Union, but share a border with Russia, feel a bit more um, at risk, especially as they have this historical tension that they were part of the USSR and were in a way like colonized under that. Uh, people don't often refer to it as colonization, but that is a bit what it was. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of historical tensions and like geographical tensions now over Russia, but I don't know much more than that about Estonia. 
Very good. Um, who else? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Um, so I was uh, wondering because there were not as many India to all the events. Do you have any insight on how India plays a role in European politics? Is there any specific role? If I heard you, because again, that's sorry, the sound is hard. Is it how India plays a role in European politics? Right? In European politics, okay. To be honest, I don't know as much about India. Um, my sphere of knowledge is really European. I know Modi is not a great guy. He's the current leader of India, and there's like concerns as there's this global swing towards the right. Uh, we have a lot of autocratic governments taking taking power around the world and India is one of them under Modi. And so I think that's as you know, we have this really like a lot of geopolitical tensions right now. We have two wars happening. We have an election in a week that uh, I think we're all very nervous about. Um, yeah, so I don't know much about India specifically, but I know that this is in that sphere of like democracy versus autocracy in India's on the other side, but I don't know much more than that, I'm sorry. All right, one or two more, uh, Terrell. So I represent Albania and Malian. So what role does Albania play in European politics? Because I thought they're actually one of the candidates for the EU. Yeah, so, um... I actually went to Albania like a week ago. So fun that you asked that. And it was for a workshop about European, like it was exactly this, what you just asked basically. So it was a workshop about, I work a lot with strategic foresight, if that's something you've ever heard of. So it's a bit like, you can't predict the future, but it's this tool that a lot of governments are starting to use of how to think about what could happen in the future. So you look at different scenarios of how different things could play out, things that could happen and what impact that would have on what you're trying to do. So I went to Tirana, Albania for a workshop on this. So it was this question of European accession with like Ukraine, um, Moldova was, Moldova only voted this week actually that they want to join the EU. So it was before that. Um, Ukraine, Albania, Montenegro, and one other country, I can't remember. And it was, um, there, there's like four countries that are currently on the, the list for European uh, enlargement and yeah, so Albania has, again, a lot of history shared with Europe. It's in continental Europe, but it's not in the European Union. They were also under this like communist blanket until I think 1996 or 1997. And so it's a bit uh, like less developed and more poor than some countries in Western Europe, but it's democratized and interested in joining the European Union, which is great. There's also a lot of shared history with Italy because a lot of people, when the border sort of opened, a lot of people went across the sea to Italy uh, and then they closed borders and a lot of people had to come back. Um, but a book I recommend is called Free by Lea Ipi. It's a memoir of someone who grew up at this time. It's super interesting, but it's written very narrative. So it doesn't, it's not like, it's very interesting. Um, but yeah, I think everyone's just waiting now to see what Albania needs to do to fully join the EU and like work on the, the reforms that need to happen to make that happen. Because as I said before with Ukraine, it's a process that can take up to 10 years. I mean, it's very variable. It really depends on how fast the country is able to adapt to, to European rule of law. There's a lot of tensions now with Hungary because Hungary again has, like I was talking about autocracy I and mean, then Hungary joined the EU, but is not meeting a lot of the rule of law concerns. There's a lot of concerns there about um, human rights. And so I think what they're trying to avoid with this enlargement is how to avoid that again and make sure countries are really like European values and rule of law oriented. Um, so Albania is part of that. Excellent. How about one more question? Uh, for you, the last one, but does anybody else in there? Go ahead, Troy. Oh, wait. Uh, ben, I'm sorry. Well, Ben and then Troy. Ben, go ahead. I'm so sending you this one Jordan Pennyball, yes, sir. No. Okay, could you be louder? Jordan, Jordan Pennyball, yes, sir. Jordan? Did I hear right? It's Jordan? Yeah, it's it's Jordan. Okay. Okay. And, and 
I don't hear much about Jordan. Yeah? Maybe uh, talking about how different countries, um, you know, if you're looking towards the future, um, not every country has the resources that many do in the EU. Uh, a country like Jordan, which has pretty well stayed out of war recently in the Middle East, but, um, you know, do they have reason to feel uh, right about the future and, and uh, you know, what would be the challenges for them in other countries? I mean, it's hard to answer because, again, I really don't know much. I don't really know anything about Jordan, and so I don't want to overstep mm -hmm. okay. my competence area. I mean, to me, the obvious thing is the war that is on their border and, you know, how that will develop and play out. Um, as you said, they've managed to stay out of it so far, but geographically, they're, they're right there. So, I mean, I, if I were in Jordan, I think my main concern would be that right now but in general countries that are at I mean I hesitate to say I, I studied international development but I I don't know if I believe in this idea of like developed versus underdeveloped or undeveloped because it's really like a process and also what do we mean by developed or it's very rich country western country oriented and a lot of the development of very rich countries have come at the expense of others like through through slavery or colonization you know so it's you can't really tell poor countries that have had their resources exploited that, oh, you should be where we are today, um, especially looking at a lot of countries in Africa. But I think that there's still hope for the future, of course. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a matter, I think, of being able to define what you want. And I think it's important. Something I work on a lot is that that's like a common vision. And this is sort of what this, coming back to this UN report, uh, our common agenda is about too is like deciding together what we think is what we not what we think will happen in the future but what we want for the future like what is the goal we are working towards and that that's something that can bring society along with it so really using different modes of public participation and trying to listen to what people fear and want and hope for and you know make this vision together to drive towards thank you uh, Troy, last question how does the EU do about the ongoing American launch in the starting soon? Uh, the, I didn't hear that super well. Yeah. Any, any oh, bad, very oh. bad, bad. Yeah, people are really worried. <laughs> um, I, I'm also very worried, to be honest. And a lot of EU discussion lately has been like, what do we do if Trump wins? Um, so like it's, I, you know, it was an interesting thing growing up in the US, because you're really taught that the US is at the center of everything. And then you move abroad and you're like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm more open-minded now. And I know that like it, there's more to the world than the US, but actually the US has a lot of power. So it really, it's not that it's the center of the universe, but it really has a huge impact. Like elections in the US have more impact globally than any other country's elections. And so that was this Pro learning process for me of thinking like okay the U.S. is at the center of everything and then no it's not and then oh it kind of is and so like I mean the U.S. it drives a lot of global trade it's a very rich country it also has a lot of power for example in the U.N. Security Council like it has a lot of weight and it's also been a a very strategic ally to countries like Ukraine for example that need their support and people are very worried about what happens to all of those things if Trump wins. So, okay. um, on that note, yeah. the note that we're all <laughs> um, Kristen, this has been terrific. Um, we thank you very much. We have recorded this. Would it be okay with you if we put it on our website for others to see? <laughs> sure. I'm a little worried if I like misrepresented any of these countries that. Um, <laughs> but I, yeah, but I think it's okay. The video before we post it. Yeah, I, I think it's okay. All right, okay, and we will just... make a donation of two hundred dollars to a nonprofit of your choosing. Um, and really, really appreciate it. Okay. Yeah, it was great to speak to you today, and good luck with all your model UN negotiations. It's a lot of fun. Good luck with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.